at chapter number 12 and verse number 3. Zechariah 12, 3. And in that day I will, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, Father, I pray now that you'd bless your holy word as it goes forth. Now, give me wisdom to, tonight, Father. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you had... Uh, if you would have been looking at this, say you're living in 18 and 30, 18 and 40, you'd be hard pressed to explain how that Jerusalem would be relevant to anything. Because in the 1800s, there wasn't much going on in Jerusalem at all. And uh, it wasn't until the uh, Balfour Declaration, latter part of the 1800s, and the influx of the Jews back into the country and to resettle their native homeland that it became prominent again. When that happened, of course, they made the desert blossom like a rose, and when they made the desert blossom like a rose, Israel became productive and became a good place to live, and the Arabs started coming in. That's fact. Now, no doubt, Arabs were there, yes, but not in the numbers that followed once Israel, once the Jews came into the land. If you notice, it says in Zechariah chapter number 12 that the, it would be a burdensome stone and to all people Jerusalem is going to affect the whole world. What I marvel at is how now here just all of a sudden uh, in the last days that it's popped up again. And uh, if you're not aware of what's happened today, the president of the United States has announced that they will move. They will move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem by recognizing it as the sovereign capital, the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Donald Trump is the first president of the United States to ever do that. He is. He's the first president to ever acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish people. And of course, he set the Arab world on fire by doing that. And I'm sure he's made a lot of enemies, but this was one of his campaign promises. He said he'd do it. And if you notice how he's, uh, he's trying to do exactly what he said he was going to do, point after point after point after point. And uh, he's, uh, he's got this tax plan passed. He's got a lot of things done. He's got a lot more he's going to do. But why is Jerusalem so important, you see? Why, why that little country on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, Sea? why is that so important? I mean, it's just a little place. Why is it so important? It's important because God said it's important. That's why it's important, because it is the city of the great king. It is where the Lord Jesus is going to come back to. When he comes back at the second advent, he's going to put his feet on the top of the Mount of Olives. They're going to split asunder underneath his feet. A water a river is going to rise up from Temple Mount, and that water is going to flow right down through that crack in the Mount of Olives and go down to the Jordan Rift, into the Jordan River, and flow into the Dead Sea, and the waters of the Dead Sea are going to be healed. And for a thousand years on either side of the bank of that river, a tree is going to grow that's for the healing of the nations. And this is going to happen. Surely as you are sitting here tonight, this is prophesied and it's going to happen. So I want to give you just a little bit of history of what we're talking about and why it's so important. Jerusalem is important. I've been there six times. I have never seen a city, a town on the face of this earth that is like Jerusalem. It's marvelous. It's remarkable. It's just, it just literally, if you want to use the terminology, it takes your breath away. Because you'll come over a hill. It's surrounded with hills. It's all, hills are all around it. And it's no huge mountain. Jerusalem doesn't sit on a huge mountain. It sits on Moriah. And that's where Abraham took his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice about 1,900 years before Christ. The name Moriah means God sees and God will be seen. And so Jerusalem is something. When you first see it, it will grab you. And you'll never get used to it because it's an ancient ancient place. It's been there a long time. Just let your mind go all the way back to Melchizedek when Abraham came back from the slaughter of the kings and he met, he met Melchizedek there in Jerusalem and he offered him bread and wine because he was the priest of the Most High God. 
Melchizedek was a priest before Aaron was ever born. He was a priest before there was a tabernacle or a temple. He was a priest representing, representing the old faith that had passed across the flood through Shem down to Melchizedek and then to Abraham when Abraham was finally called out of Ur of the Chaldees. It is the progression of faith that starts with Adam and, and, and is handed down to his son Seth and then Noah carries it across the flood and then Noah hands it to Shem. Shem carries it until it is given to uh, Melchizedek and then Abraham and then of course the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and then Jacob's 12 sons. That's where the line of truth goes all through the Old Testament scriptures. So it's very important. 722 B.C., Israel was taken captive, the northern ten tribes. 586 B.C., the southern two tribes carried captive. 473 B.C., Haman. Uh, Haman, the Agathite, tried to uh, do away with all the Jews. 169 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple, killed a swine, and became a type of the Antichrist. 70 A.D., Titus turned one ever stone he could find upside down trying to find buried treasure he was told in the temple mount but he was fulfilling bible prophecy 135 a.d bar Kokhba led a revolt against rome and when he led that revolt uh, he brought on he brought on probably the worst suffering that israel ever had because uh, because uh, the uh, Hadrian crucified Jews all over the place. Hundreds of thousands of Jews died because of what uh, Bar Kokhba had led them to do. A.D. 339, Emperor Constantinus made it illegal for Jews to intermarry with Christians. 438 A.D., Emperor Theodosius banned Jews from all high offices in the Roman world. 531 A.D., Justinian resurrected and enforced the prohibitions of Theodosius. And uh, 630 A.D., the Byzantine emperor Heraclius connived at the massacre of Jews had, he, who had reinfiltrated Palestine. 722, Emperor Leo III ordered all Jews to become Christians. Are you noticing something happening here? There's a pattern. 1066 A.D., the Muslim rulers of Granada in Spain massacred 4,000 Jews in a single day. Then in 1096 AD, AD, Pope Urban II proclaimed the first crusade to rid the Holy Land of the Muslims. So they took off to kill the Muslims in, uh, in, in the Holy Land. But on their way, they would go through villages that were populated by Jews. You know what they did to them? They burned them alive. They murdered and massacred every Jew they could find on the way to Jerusalem. In 1149, the Berbers controlled the greater part of Spain, gave Spanish Jews the usual choice, convert to Islam or get out. 1215 A.D., the Fourth Lateran Council of the Roman Catholic Church ordered all Jews to wear a badge to distinguish them from other people just like Hitler did. And Hitler was not original with that star that he put on them. It came from 1215 AD. The edict was known as the Law of the Patch. Its purpose was to segregate and degrade the Jews. 1290 AD, all Jews were ordered out of England by Edward I. 1306 AD, all Jews ordered out of France by Philip IV. 1475, all Jews in the Italian city of Trent killed. 1371, Jews massacred in Castile. 1391, massacred in Seville. 1479, Ferdinand and Isabella, United Spain, cleared the country of Moors. The Moors were the, were the, uh, were the Muslim Arabs who came across the Straits of Gibraltar into, the, into, into Europe. The Catholic Church introduced the Inquisition to root out heretics, especially Jews and Muranos. A new chapter of horror began for all who disagreed with Rome especially of Jewish blood. 1483, Torquemada arrived in Spain. He served as the father confessor to the queen and made the Spanish Inquisition the most feared instrument of terror in the medieval world. 1492, you all know what happened that year, don't you? The Edict of Expulsion, 300,000 Jews were tossed out of Spain and set out on a dreadful journey to nowhere. 1506, many Spanish Jews had sought refuge in neighboring Portugal, were mobbed and massacred. 1648, hundreds of thousands of Jews in Poland massacred by the Cossacks. 1660, the Jews of Europe 
accused of spreading the Black Death, which was depopulating the continent, and in country after country they were slaughtered by the panic-stricken populace. Put a side note here. Do you know why they were accused of, of, of creating the Black Death in 1660? It is because the Jews were not dying like the Europeans. You know why? Because of their dietary and dietary habits and because of their hygiene. That's exactly right. You know where they got that from? The Old Testament. <laughs> that saved them. And uh, so it is. 1897, uh, Theodore Herzl. 1897, Theodore Herzl said enough of this. Enough is enough is enough. It's time for a Jewish homeland. And that brings you up to date. Because in 1897, the wheels started rolling to bring it about. Isaiah chapter number 11, verses 11 through 15 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, Shinar, from Hamath, and from the isles of the sea. He's already returned them one time. This is the second time. Fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 43 verses 5 through 7 says, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. The prophet spoke again of this gathering of the Jewish people when he called them from the north, the south, the east, the west. The Jews of the north, the Jews of the south. In other words, Israel and Judah were brought together as one. He brought them together. They were separated. Now he's coming and he's bringing them back together. Isaiah chapter number 60 verses 8 through 12. Listen carefully to this prophecy. You might want to read this one with me. Isaiah chapter number 60, verses 8 through 12. This is a remarkable thing. Isaiah chapter number 60, verses 8 through 12. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver, their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. When did they fly? Operation Solomon. They went into Ethiopia and they brought those Yemenite Jews out of there and brought them to the Holy Land on 747s. Yes, they did. Fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter number 60, where he said they would fly. <laughs> Men weren't flying back then when Isaiah wrote that prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 16 says, Therefore behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Watch this. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land, and I will gather up their fathers. In plainer words, what I'm about to do when I bring them from the four quarters of the earth is far greater than what I did when I brought them up out of Egypt. That's what he's saying after 400 years. Here's bottom line. Mess with Israel and God's going to mess with you. <laughs> they are over there for a reason. I wonder about Donald Trump, don't you? Jeremiah chapter number 16, uh, 23 rather, and verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds. They shall be fruitful and increase. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Did you know that they still haven't all come back yet? They're in what's called the diaspora. You have two Israels. You have Eretz Israel, which is the land of Israel. And then you have the people of Israel, which are scattered throughout the world. Everywhere you go, practically, you'll find the Jewish people. And the president of the United States of America, for the first time in a long time, has brought this country into a favorable relationship with Israel. 
Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Now, I want you to remember something. You don't have to be a saint for God to use you. God used Cyrus in the Old Testament. You know, so you need to kind of get that, get that thing right. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> a lot of these preachers get all carried away with their preaching. A lot of good preaching has nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Pre preaching practical things, but they're not scriptural. You don't have to be a saint for God to use you. Amen. I've heard preachers say God won't use a dirty vessel. Hogwash. He used Herod. Yes, he did. He can use anybody in anything he pleases at any time. Ezekiel chapter number 11, uh, verses uh, 17 through 19. Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 24. These are all scriptures that have a direct bearing on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the return of Israel to their land. In 1917, 1917, General Lord Allenby liberated Palestine from the Turks. And who was it raising a stink today about <coughs> Erdogan? What's he connected with? That's right. And what's that ancient name for it? Persia. They're not Arabs. They're Persian. Yes, sir. So in 1947, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the idea of a partition to Palestine as a solution that would satisfy the problem with the Jews and the Arabs. But it didn't do it. On May the 14th, 1948, Israel was proclaimed, proclaimed a state. David Ben-Gurion, you can get onto YouTube, folks. Log onto YouTube and type it in and you can see him standing there. You can see a historical clip of David Ben-Gurion standing in that chamber announcing the sovereignty and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. That was a big deal. Amen. After all those centuries and every kind of an opposition you could imagine, they were born of a, 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 again as a nation. 1949, Chaim Wiseman became the first president of Israel. 1956, the Sinai War broke out. 1967, another war broke out. 1973, we have the Yom Kippur War. Every war Israel has fought, God has intervened, I personally believe, and preserved them to this very day. But waiting in the shadows is, Ma, is, Gog, is Gog and Magog. Waiting in the shadows is the Antichrist. And waiting in the shadows is the true Christ. All of this stuff's coming together now. I've said time and time again that Bible prophecy is the wild west of the church. So what do you mean by that? No laws, no rules, no regulations. Every man does as he own, as he, as he sees it, writes books, sells books, and the books and after about five or ten years, throw them away. They're not worth a dime. Here's the bottom line. There's only one who knows when he's coming back. And there's only one who knows how these nations are going to align themselves and come together in the end. The only one. But here's the thing you need to understand. Keep your support for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will one day be the city of the great king again. David will sit on a throne in Jerusalem and reign over the 12 tribes of Israel. And for a thousand years, he's going to reign on this earth. He's going to reign as the king of kings and the Lord of lords and as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if you're a born again believer tonight, you're going to reign with him. That's what he says in the book of Revelation chapter 20. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, when something like this happens today, I think it's very significant. Because all, nothing happens in a vacuum, does it? No. And if you always, have you noticed the domino effect? When something happens, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And then there's the domino effect. What will this cause to happen now? Now, we Mahmoud Abbas and some of the other Arab leaders are calling for three days of rage. I mean, when did they ever stop raging? <laughs> That's what it says over here in the book of Psalms, doesn't it? Let's see over here. Chapter number two, the heathen rage. Yeah, that's what it says. It says, boy, you sound like you're pro-Israel. Well, I hope I do. <laughs> Verse one, Psalm two. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord Jehovah and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The only way 
that you'll ever find your way through the minefield of all of this crazy uh, so-called prophetic utterances that people are giving out where they, you know, they, they got this alignment. First it was the ten nations of the European Confederacy. Then it's this, then it's that, then it's this. And this stuff just comes crumbling down. And, you know, people, they're messing it. Stick with Israel. Watch what God is doing with the Jew and watch the way the, that the nations align themselves as it relates to the Jew and to Israel. Because that's all important. Because that is what the Lord Jesus is going to judge every nation by when he comes back. Is how he deals with Israel. How he deals with the Jew. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth tonight. Donald Trump's put a, he put a feather in his cap. I mean, when he got up there and said, and, and remember this. He is not part of the swamp. And he doesn't owe him a dime. <coughs> and he's not one bit interested in whether or not he's, he'll be able to, after he leaves office is whether he can he can call on them for support or help or this or that he's 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 worth you know ten thousand million dollars they say multi-billionaire all right he's, he's got all the money he needs all the money he'll ever want and for some reason or another he seems to be really headed in the right direction when it comes to some of these things are very important i don't know how much he's read the bible but it seems like he's gathered around himself some counselors that are telling him that little spot down there in Israel is a big deal. He's gathered them around. Now, here he has said this. And he's made this declaration. Now, they're telling us on the news. They're saying, well, you know, sure, he made it. But it'll tell you, you've got to secure the land. You have to, you have to do all your surveys and your tests. You've got to make sure that you're going to be, it's going to be, there's going to be, it's going to be safe. Then you've got to build the building and you've got to get the bids and you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you do this and do that. It wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't in a year or two have an embassy sitting over there in Jerusalem. You know why? That's his expertise. He's a builder. There's never been a president of this country that's the builder like that man's a builder. Wouldn't it be something before the next election? The uh, 20, for his term, uh, 16, what is it, uh, 20? Isn't that when he's running again? Uh, next, uh, 2020, the next presidential election that an embassy is sitting over there in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be something? That he has it done. And the naysayers, uh, they, they, uh, they're not going to stop it. Here's the bottom line. If the Lord wants to get this done, he's going to get it done. Now, I spoke to a man one time years ago. And he told me, he said, I do not believe that the nation of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. I said, you don't? He said, no. He said, I don't believe that. I said, well, why don't you believe that? He said, well, he said that it's, it's a secular state and it was, and it was, something, it was something that was done by, 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 by people not really wanting to fulfill Bible prophecy. They were, they were simply wanting a Jewish homeland. And then you have the Hasidic Jews, you know, the ones who have the the curls around this, they don't round the corners of their head, according to, I think it's Deuteronomy. They do not recognize the state of Israel as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. There's a lot of people over there that believe that until the Messiah comes back, there'll be no Israel. That when he comes back, he will establish the nation. Then there are those over there who believe that we've got to build a temple before the Messiah comes back. And when we build it, we'll bring him back. Are you following the thinking now? You got the Christians, and I don't, you know, I mean, you, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Who do not believe that the nation as it stands today is a fulfillment of scripture. I do. I do. I firmly do. It is the only place... On the face of this earth, where God ever put his name. That's right. And you can go over there and all of those places over there that you've read about in your Bible, they're there, every one of them. I've been there, folks. I've been there six times. I've been five times with Brother Bob Bevington. Brother Bob Bevington probably went two or three hundred times. <laughs> he did go about 45 times. Yeah. About 45 and uh, maybe 50. I don't know. Someone may know exactly how many, but I know he would, he'd been over there more than anybody that I had ever seen.
Brother Bob Bevington, he'd been there time and time. He knew that place. If anybody knew the Holy Land, it was Bob Bevington. And so I was privileged to go with him five times, and I really enjoyed it. And then I led one tour myself. I took a group of people over there, and uh, we had a good tour. Uh, I did this after I'd been with him and learned a few things, where to go and so forth. And every time I ever went to that land, I felt something. I experienced something. There's something there. Did you know, folks, that people have what's called the Jerusalem syndrome or the Israeli syndrome? Do you know what that is? This is the truth I'm telling you tonight, and this happens all the time. People will get off of the jet, and they'll put their feet down on that land, and something happens to them. Some of them will think they're John the Baptist. They will. They'll think they're Elijah. They'll, they'll, they'll think there's some Bible character, and you can't get them out of it. And for as long as they're there, they're living in a daze. It literally, it literally overwhelms them. They didn't expect that to happen. They were just as normal as anybody in this auditorium tonight. But all of a sudden, it just blows them away. There's something about that land. There's something about it. And no other land on this earth is like that land. And I'll tell you something right now, folks. They're there because God put them there. Amen. And I must say this to the, to the Palestinians. Uh, do you know where the word Palestine came from? You all know. I've told you many times. It flipped, yes. And who called them that? It was 135 A.D., Hadrian. Okay. He not only crucified Jews all over the place, okay, because of Bar Kokhba. He renamed the city of Jerusalem, Alia Capitolina. He put a Cardo Maximus down the street. In other words, a great street leading up to a pagan shrine. All right. And he renamed the whole countryside Palestine. Palestine after their old ancient enemy, the Philistine. Hadrian did that. Yeah. So anytime you hear somebody going on Palestine, 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 most of the time, the, what you, most of the time, most of what you hear out of people is what they heard somebody else say, right? Okay. Very few people take time to read anything, check into what they're talking about. I don't refer to it as Palestine. I refer to it as Israel. And the reason I call it Israel is because that's what God called it. Do you know who gave the city of Jerusalem to the Jews? Who, who won it over to the Jews? David. Yes. And what did he do? Who was in there before David went in there? Jebusites. The Jebusites. Jebus is what it was called. Jebus. David went in there. He's the warrior king. He drove them out. And when he drove the Jebusites out... The, uh, the, uh, uh, the city fell into the hands of the Jews or Israel. They, they named it Yerushalayim and it became the capital of Israel. Yeah. It is the ancient capital of the Israeli people and, the re and it started with David. Now, who is David a type of? <laughs> right, he's a type of Christ. He's the greatest king type in the Old Testament of Christ. David is. There's no greater king type than David. Than David, none. I'm talking about king type. Joseph is a wonderful type of Christ, but he's not a king, see. So, yes, David won it. He won it in battle, and he handed it to Israel. It became their king. It became their capital. Well, who do you think is going to come back and take Jerusalem the next time and take it away from the Philistines, and he's going to give it back to his people? That's right, David's son. And it's going to happen as sure as you're there to, as sure as you hear me tonight. That Bible will be fulfilled. Yes, yes sir. Uh, talking about King Cyrus, if you line him up with uh, Donald Trump, the characteristics. Are there a lot of, lot of oh, comparisons there? Oh, big time. <laughs> Oh, he did. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> when Cyrus saw his name in the scriptures, 
In the book of Isaiah, that did it for him. Well, that's be worth checking into, yeah. Yeah, the comparison between Cyrus and Donald Trump. All right. Well, hallelujah, folks. How many, how many would it make you mad if the Lord came back next week? <laughs> I mean, yeah, right now. <laughs> they don't want to wait for a week. Right now. <laughs> Boy, all right, I'm done tonight. Hallelujah. That excited me. I don't know about you. That excited me. When he did that, I said, Hallelujah. Yeah, that repetitive cycle there you're talking about, there's something in that. Now, yeah. now we've got uh, in, uh, Jerusalem being named as the capital by, by the United States. Maybe that's what this year is all about. Yeah, 2018. 2017. This, well, you, okay, this year. Not thought you're not referring to this coming year, but this year. Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen next year? Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I mean, I give him an A plus 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 for that job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And here's and this needs to be mentioned tonight. He had bipartisan support for that. A lot of Democrats supported that. They sure did. A lot of Democrats, not just Republicans. Democrats supported that, too. Sure did. Bipartisan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, you have any prayer requests tonight?